Yo, we're here, Jeremy. What's going on? Ah, a lot is going on. Yeah. Did you want hey, me to elaborate? I'll say, <laughs> tell the people what's happening. I think people want to know. What's oh, what's on. happening? What's happening? Uh, so on the Angular side, we're doing all of our 2022 planning. A lot of a lot of exciting projects. I'm <gasps> I'm genuinely just really looking forward to the next year and all the cool stuff we're gonna do. Yeah, I'm hoping. Fingers crossed that my proposal gets into the uh, the planning for this year. I have a, a cool. I think it's a cool proposal. It's a quad quality of life improvement. I think that our developers will appreciate. So I'm going to submit it uh, next week, right before the holidays, of course, because mm -hmm. why not? <laughs> but I can't wait to submit that. Is it an ng mark directive that just adds your Twitter feed to someone's app? <laughs> well, how did you know? How <laughs> did you know? <laughs> uh, let's see who's in the building right now watching us live. We have some great people. I wish I could say all of your names. I, I can't pronounce some of these, but we do good to see you. Uh, Let's see, Neil C. from Brazil. Neil from Brazil, what's up? Uh, Hans in the building. You prepared a lot of questions. Let's go. Paul K. in the building. Let's go. Good to see you. Uh, it's going to be great today. It's Chris in the building. Listen, if you want to get a shout out right now from the Angular team, go ahead and say hello. We love seeing you, for you friends out there. And uh, it's great. You friends. I always want to say you folks, and I end up defaulting to you friends. Yeah. All right. Let, let's see who else. All right, friends. Well, listen, let's uh, get started. Jeremy, you want to kick this game off and let the people yeah. know what's going on? I want to kick this game off. Uh, so this is a little indie game that I have not played before. I'm going to go ahead and get it started here and get this up in the stream. Excellent. Ethan, Julio, Spirit, good to see you. Robert. Robert, new here, first time, looks like your first time caller, long time listener. Uh, Robert, we're glad to have you. All right, Mershad, hello, 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 hello. Fila's coming all the way through from Nigeria. Let's go. Oh, okay, wait, I got to add your screen in here, I think. Yeah, so you're the, you're the director in this show. That's true. All right, so what game are we playing today? So this game is called uh, Yinglet or Inglet. I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced, but it is this little indie cute platformer. So I'm going to go ahead and skip the intro because it's very abstract. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so start a new file. Uh, go to the hardest level. The hardest level? No. <laughs> there's tr there's chill, tricky, and challenging. It defaulted to challenging, so I'll I'll, I'll do that. All right. Assist that option. Sounds good. Begin. All right, let's see. We should play Wreckfest on Stadia. It's awesome. You can invite other players to join. Lars, if it's non-violent, like no guns or anything, then we will totally uh, make that work. I love Stadia, so I'm super happy to play. And we'll get Jeremy a Stadia controller. He can, oh, he can all play I've, online. I've got my I've got my Stadia controller right here. Let's go. And I'm not kidding. I have mine. Uh, yep. So I'm ready. I just got my kid a Stadia controller as well, so he can play on iPad because our PWA on iOS is amazing. So uh, yeah, so he loves that. Plays Paw Patrol. Oops. Okay. I died. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so how do we know like, how to play? So I'm guessing these are like little cells or something, right? And so you're mm -hmm. going from one to one. And so I can hold down this button and do this like little burst here. But I don't know what that does. Is that like an echo location? Because it seems like there's a response from the side. Yeah, these things, like there's a little ripple that goes through them. Oh, see, yeah, it turned them into platforms I can move into. And so I can charge up Very again cool. uh, in Ripple. All right, so we. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, elbow cough. Okay, somebody. Okay, the show. It's good to see you. Welcome to the party. 
Um, let's see. Okay, uh, just getting into Angular. So Robert says, just getting into Angular, actually enjoying it now that I can navigate. Robert, type in the chat what's your favorite part so far. And also let us know an area that as a new person that you feel like you wish was a little bit easier so we can get some uh, ideas on what you need so we can try to help. A little color burst. All right, Andy in the building. Play Don't Starve Together. That sounds fun. Oh, yeah. We actually did that um, a while ago. Uh, Stephen flew in and, uh, and Jen and I played that on stream back when we were streaming very, very late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Play Don't also, starve. This, is, this is neat, Mark. If you pause in one of these cells, it eventually turns into a checkpoint so that if you <gasps> die, you'll uh, restart there. It's a good little so, bit of game design. So what is uh, so? Are you are you still trying to figure out like how this works, like the I mean, uh, the goal? <laughs> oh, because there's nowhere to go from there. Ah, so very cool. it's really just like it's a platformer, right? You're moving from platform to platform, but rather than it being based on gravity, well, like there's still gravity, but like you can move around freely inside of these these boxes right it's not your traditional like there's no jump right i'm not jumping i'm just kind of using my momentum to move mm, okay i'm picking up what you're putting down all right mm -hmm. let's uh let's answer some questions of uh, with the people yes uh, someone asked are we open to questions yes bring your questions yeah, yeah bring your questions we want to answer them here oh this is a tricky one okay so let's see yeah so hans yeah definitely bring your questions uh we could let's see so there's a lot of angular love in here so that's pretty great when will angular outpass react i mean it that's that's a question that's like really hard to answer because in some areas we are uh, we are a leader in a lot of the, the spaces uh angular is a leader in a lot of the spaces and there's some places where i think react might be uh doing a really good job so yeah and i also like it's not a competition right like right We've, we've talked about this uh, before, Mark, is like, they're all good, right? Everything's yeah, good. Yeah, right. Everything, I love that. We should get t-shirts for the stream that just say everything's good, because it's true. Everything is good. Okay, so this little blue bar you bounce on. Like, like cover some gaps, because you might not have enough momentum to get to mm -hmm. the next little cell. Got it. So I don't know. I just hit this little like. There's this little other thing here now. I'm following that. Whee. Oh, there's a color thing up there. Oh, here's a great question. What, what is the best source to learn about uh, accessibility for web apps? Like, if you want to uh, learn about accessibility in general, I think that is a great, great question. Uh, because it's hard. <laughs> it is really mm -hmm. hard to learn everything you need for web accessibility. Um, in fact, I'm even working on uh, a course in web accessibility as like a 20% project right now. Um, wow, that's amazing. It's not very far. It's, I mean, it's, it's still got a, a ways to go, but it's something I'm working on. But the resources I tend to recommend to people, um, developers.google.com has an accessibility's fundamentals section, which is a pretty good introduction point. Um, that I think if you are just really starting out for the very first time, uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, similarly, there is a YouTube series called A11Y Cast from Rob Dodson, uh, who is formerly of Chrome DevRel. And those are also really excellent introductory uh, tutorials for someone who has not really done much accessibility before. And if you prefer to consume content as videos rather than as text, they uh, give you that form factor. Um, and then um, there are some books I really enjoy. Um, if I wasn't sitting here playing this game, I'd go get them from the other room and show them off. Um, but one is, there's three book recommendations I'll give. Uh, one is called A Web for Everyone, which gives a very high level overview of web accessibility in terms of like, what is accessibility? Why should you care about it? And what does the landscape or the ecosystem of web accessibility look like? Um, some of these platforms are disappearing now. Um, so after that, uh, there are two books by Hayden Pickering that I really like. 
Uh, one is called Inclusive Patterns, um, which is just mm. kind of about general accessible patterns. And then uh, my favorite is called um, Inclusive Components, uh, also by Hayden Pickering, which is a like very deep dive into designing some common component interaction patterns for accessibility, things like carousels and tabs and menus. And it's been really informative to the way that I think about accessibility for UI components, um, which has evolved a bit over the years. So there is a book that I like for this called Boot Camper's Guide to Web Accessibility. It's a really practical book. And I read it. It's by Lindsay Kopax. And uh, I'm going to share that link as well. Uh, it's really interesting because, you know, this author just goes through the book itself. I mean, sorry, goes, goes through their experience. And they just share, like, practical things that they learned because they learned web accessibility from, oh, hey, we got to solve this problem now. And I'm the one who's on the hook to do it. So now I have to figure out what's needed, right? Which I think is an interesting, I mean, it's kind of like trial by fire, but you'll also get some very practical accessibility uh, tips. And maybe Jeremy, one thing we can do is you and I can uh, grab all those links and share them in the show notes. Oh yeah. Today. Um, and since we are here playing games, actually, there's another thing uh, I'll recommend about accessibility is that there is a YouTube channel called Game Makers Toolkit. And that channel has a series about accessibility in video games, which is also really interesting. It's not as technically applicable to web development, but it is relevant in terms of how one might think about building accessible experiences or the kinds of people who would benefit from more accessible experiences. Oh, this is a very cool channel. I'm just looking at some of the, the, the things they're talking about. Like, yeah, because I know that The Last of Us Part Two got a lot of positive feedback in terms of how over, how how much of an improvement over the previous installments the accessibility was to the point where, you know, people were like, this game is actually enjoyable for people with disabilities, which is really awesome to see. Oh, it's getting more complicated now, Mark. We've got like little rails that we're traveling on. I saw that. I'm like, what is happening? I got a dash. <laughs> I wish I understood what was happening. Uh, Wait, how did you suspend yourself in air like that? So I have a dash now. All right, so here, I can go in this little yellow thing and it shoots me down this track. I bounce on the blue things. And so I've got this kind of physics. And then it shoots me up there and I can dash. Looks like a one shot dash? Yeah, you got one dash. And so now cool. I can. Cool. I can go here, dash up there. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Should have made okay, myself. Okay, let's let's ask some more questions. Uh, Julio says Angular plus Nest JS. I think that's a, the idea, like server side rendering and magic around that type of stuff. Jeremy, any comments on Angular and server side rendering slash? meta frameworks uh i don't like there's no we don't have anything official to to talk about like obviously angular does have angular universal for doing server-side rendering um one mm -hmm. of the things we've been chatting about recently um in part as part of our 2022 conversations is if we want to spend some more time um making the hydration story for angular a little bit better uh, so right now with angular universal you get your server rendered page but then when angular bootstraps in the browser it just overwrites all that DOM and starts the app up kind of all over again. And so you get that initial view of like users see something sooner, but it doesn't really do much to improve the time to interactivity. And so we are going to be potentially looking at, um, are there ways we could improve the hydration story so that we're reusing that server rendered DOM and attaching Angular to it so that the interactivity is a little bit faster. Yeah. Time to the, that TTI gets faster. Yeah, yeah I love that. Uh, so is Angular language service going to support, oh wait, you know what, I'm, I'm reading these questions 
I forgot that I can just click on them and have them show up on the screen. <laughs> so is Angular Language Service going to support string literal intelligence? Oh, string literal intelligence in the template anytime soon. For example, export a type. You have input like type or checkbox. It still does not work. Interesting. Uh, so I don't know. Um, that one, if there's no feature request for it on GitHub, then definitely go file a feature request. And if there is a feature request, go ahead and upvote it because the feature request process is very much, uh, it takes into consideration the number of votes that an issue has. Yes, definitely file that issue, please. Seriously, Paul, if uh, this is a thing that has not been put in there, put it in there so we can see it and we can try to get to it. We can prioritize it and see if we can fit it in if it aligns with the way things are going for us. Hi, hey, Kevin, let's go. With all the H I I I I I I, I like that. I like that energy, Kevin. Uh, in your opinion, what is the list of things to improve your Angular skills, like RX, JS, NGRX, and others? Well, I want to tell you what I think. I think that your the first thing to improve your skills is to build various types of applications, because I think it's gonna it's really easy to like gain a lot of head knowledge of like, hey. This other thing exists in Angular, but you don't have the practical knowledge because you haven't built an application that uses it. So I think that you will discover more skills by actually building out more types of applications. But I want to hear Jeremy's point of view on this. Yeah, um, I agree. The, the best way to grow your skills is to just try different things. Um, it can be hard sometimes, right? If your like, full-time job is programming and you want to like try something new to find the time to like go like oh you know i'm gonna go try like svelte or, or something for a day but you know it's always worth it because it can help you see things through a different lens and realize there's not always one way of thinking about things sure yeah and i'll tell you i like to do things like imagine how i would build some of my favorite applications like one thing that i love is TikTok, and it's just so addicting and whenever i have like an uh, hour and a half to spare because that's how long you get sucked into the portal of TikTok. Um, I, I try to imagine, well, how could I build this in Angular? I'm not saying Angular is the right answer for this, but how could I build it in Angular, right? And then I start to think about, well, what are the tools that would be needed? And so that can kind of that kind of directs me sometimes. But hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, okay, let's see. Hans is coming through. He said he had a lot of questions, or they said they had a lot of questions. So we got to go through it let's see how can we build runtime dynamic uis without ng if spamming or jit madness for example different ui depending on admin or user logs in oh okay yes okay 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 so like yeah that kind of makes sense uh jeremy are you kind of following this question where they're just asking yeah. like yeah just uh, different uis what's the best way what's the best architecture decision to make around that yeah so um you can dynamically load components and templates today based on conditions, right? So you can define like multiple components of like, I don't know, let, let's say you've got a permissions view or a settings view that is going to change based on the permissions. If the UIs are going to be dramatically different, then you can author different components for each of those experiences and then just load the component that you want to show based on uh, whatever conditions your app needs. So you can have like admin view, regular user view, guest user view, and use something like ng component outlet to load whichever of those components uh, makes the most sense there. Yes, there you go. Good answer. Will it be possible at some point to lazy load ng templates? I also imagine different users log in that have different products and services that will show in a UI. Lazy loading ng templates. Um, so in a, in a way you kind of can do that already because a component has templates like associated with it. Um, it's like Angular's not really designed for things like ng templates to exist in isolation without existing within the context of a component. So it would be a larger architectural change to have a template as a standalone concept that you could lazy load. Um, whereas right now, Angular is primarily designed around the component being the like atom from which other things are composed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there's any plans about that, although 
Um, being able to do more granular lazy loading more easily is something that we talk about pretty often. So it is possible today to do lazy loading at component or directive boundaries, um, but it's not the most ergonomic thing in the world. And we, um, we're, we've we always been interested in doing something a little bit more <laughs> user-friendly than what exists today. Yeah, we're working on it. We're, do, we're doing what we can, we're working on it. Okay. All right, friends, if you're just joining us right now, this is just a chill and Q&A session. Oh, Jeremy, I like that, how you could, how it angled when you went against yeah. that, that springboard. That was that was clever. So that's, yes, anyway, we're playing a game, and if you have questions, put them in the chat. Go ahead, Jeremy, what were you going to say? Uh, so yeah, uh, this game is pretty cool, right? You can, like, bounce off of these orange things, and, like, you get another dash afterwards. Um, oh, kind of reminds me of Celeste. Uh, yeah. Um, I love Celeste. Yeah, that's a pretty hard game, and I feel like depends on the controller you play with, has a lot of impact on how you end up playing. Yeah, I, I played Celeste on the Switch, and... Um, Me too. <laughs> the, I think I, I did have a lot of problems with sometimes trying to dash, like, right and always getting like diagonal upright or downright. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's exactly why I stopped playing on Twitch. Um, you know, so speaking of gaming platforms in general, so I love Stadia, but I would love to see us like release a little bit heftier controller, like a little bit more like weighty, that feels a little bit closer to like the weight of or stability of the PS5 controller. That controller feels really good. And when you play with that and you pick up the Stadia controller, it feels a little bit lighter. And now I, I, I just think we can like heft this thing up a little bit. Yeah, like I appreciate the design consideration of the Stadia controller being light, uh, just because it's like less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Less strain on your wrists if you're like holding yeah. it for a long period of time. Um, but yeah, the PS5, PS5 controller is very like nice and solid. Yes, that's the word exactly. A little bit more solid. But you know, I'll give Google a lot of credit. I guess I give us a lot of credit on this. That for a first controller, a first gen controller, this is a this was a good design. Because I do you remember the Ouya by any chance? I mean, I was aware of it. I saw it on Kickstarter, but uh, I never like used one or anything. You ain't missing nothing. I mean, literally, uh, look, I have my Ouya. I have my Ouya right here. I this little Android device, and the controller for this thing was really bad. I feel mm -hmm. bad saying that, but it's true. What do I mean if I plug this in? Like, would it start up? I don't even know what would happen. <laughs> I haven't put it in like six years. But I really believed in that Kickstarter. So uh, that was a lot of fun. Let's see. What do we think about Narwhal and NX? Uh, I think it's, um, I know a lot of people use it and it provides um, a bunch of capabilities on top of Angular CLI. Um, yep. And that's great. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. what I feel too. It goes back to again. It's like it's all good. Everything is good. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, Jeremy, I didn't get a chance to call this out earlier, but I do want to call it out. Uh, let's see. Where did that go? This is something really cool. And I have, and I'll tell people this: you don't want us to do a get a stream where we make a game. Because game development is not fun to watch. <laughs> like, it's just, I've made some games. Game development is not fun to watch. You, what you want to see is a, the compilation of like when we're done and how it looked, but you don't want to see us like trying to figure out why collision detection isn't working. <laughs> you know what I mean? For an hour and a half. Like, that's not the game you want to see. Yep. And we, we are not game developers. And so <laughs> we'd just be fumbling around all over the place. Man. Um, the, although there is uh, this thing, uh, the Flutter team is now like has some type of partnership with a, this one called Flame, which is a uh, game dev toolkit. And I want to see from a game dev point of view, does Flame do anything for game development the same way Flutter did for mobile development? Right? Like, does it do something magical like that? 
All right. Oh, uh, Lars says, congrats to Jeremy, by the way. So oh. Congrats <laughs> <to> you. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people have been telling me that. <laughs> just, uh, I think I was telling Mark, just means less time to code. Less time to code. Yeah. No, but it's good. Uh, I'm happy to to do whatever I can to, to help the team and... Uh, I was just watching Ted Lasso yesterday for the first time and he said something there where, you know, he loves coaching in that he loves helping people live up to their potential on and off the field. And I feel like that's a good way to think about being in any kind of like leadership position, whether it's like being a manager or not. Yeah, well, I think you're going to be great for this team. I really do think that your leadership it's going to usher in a new era. And yeah, I know I'm really positive. So people watching at home, like, dude, this guy's always positive, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, for real, like, I really like, I see changes as a way for just new opportunity and new greatness to happen. And I think under Jeremy, we're going to learn a lot. We're going to see some things from a different perspective, which is going to hopefully lead to some great changes that'll help the community. So I, for one, am excited. And I told him congratulations early on, and I was pumped up. And he was just kind of like, yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, is it possible to, to lazy load Matt side nav? Um, you could. Uh, I mean, it's just like any other component. But Matt side nav itself is like composed of multiple components. So you'd probably want to load, lazy load something in it. Um, so the, the weird thing about Matt SideNav is that the component contains both the container, like the SideNav part and the main content part. And the reason it does that is it supports these different modes, some of which impact the layout of that main content. And so in cases where you're just doing the like slide over the main content, right? Um, it's easy to just load that as a standalone thing and treat it as a dialogue. But in modes where you need the side nav to push the main content over, um, mm. that is like it needs to obviously be aware of that main content. Or in cases where it causes the main content to shrink and reflow, you also need to know about the main content. And so the side nav itself isn't just like this floating thing you can load in dynamically, it actually is the container for everything within your view. And so lazy, lazy loading it kind of from that sense um, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but you could always, if you if you did want to do that kind of like dialogue style side nav, you could just make your own like pop up there using the CDK overlay and it would be relatively straightforward. All right, I'm actually going to see if we can. Well, we got a, quite a few more questions, so let's see if we can get through. Yeah. See, Mark, hey, I wonder from you, from you yeah. is this game is? Uh, do you find this intriguing? Because I'm like, I'm loving this. I want to play it so I can like put together the what I'm sensing from watching you play to what it feels like. Like, like I want to know, like you know what the physics feel like because I feel like it's, this is a very intriguing game. and I love things that are just like puzzly and challenging it's very experimental where you just kind of try stuff and the world responds in sometimes surprising ways yeah uh, but yeah what was you had another question there Oh, yeah, with lots of questions. People are coming through. Uh, are there any plans for strongly typed reactive forms? Oh, 100% yes on that. Um, yes. You probably have seen the RFC, uh, or you could go see the RFC on uh, our GitHub repo. Yep, I want to link it to strongly typed reactive forms RFC. I want to see if I can find that quickly. Uh, I know that people have been asking for this for a long time. And we have an RFC out there on GitHub, so definitely check out our GitHub. Yeah, and I'm I'm really um, impressed with the design that the team came up with, um, especially when it comes to how we're dealing with resettable forms, um, because the way the current form system works is that you can reset a form group or a field or whatever 
and the value would become null and you may not be expressing that null in your types um, and so uh, there's some design around making um, making uh, things that are resettable uh, have optional values so that when you reset them they will go to the optional value mm. um, and you're not having to make everything in the forms module be strictly nullable trying to see if I can find an RSC pretty quickly. So there is a demo. If you want to look at it, you could probably find your way from, from the demo to the RSC, but I want to put that out there just in case people are interested. So I love this little design detail of this game, where if you do fall, your little character model doesn't ever disappear and the rest of the world just reappears around you. Yeah, I saw that actually. Like that's that that's really a nice clever. little touch. I don't know that I've seen a game do that before. So let's see what's happening. What is that is that triangle, a green triangle telling you where to go? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I that does seem like a little bit of signposting, yeah. And this also reminds me of Hotline Miami, where you don't know, like, you have to lose a bunch of times in order to find out what the right way is. Yeah. So let's go up here. There's like a little thing up there that I'm trying to get to that I think is off the critical path. So what is our opinion about Web3 and the future of Angular? Uh, I want to take this one. Um, and, and I love to hear what you say, but yeah, Web3, this, that story is still being written. I mean, there's just still so many unknowns before we can even make any like really educated guesses about what that looks like for even Web3's own future, right? Like we're not even certain that Web3 will become the next web, so to speak. Some really cool ideas in it, I think. Yeah, I think it's a really cool idea, but that story's way, way underdeveloped at this point. What about the future of Angular? The future is so bright for Angular that I need to wear shades. I need to express that. That is what's happening. Angular is on the way to some really cool stuff. Jeremy? Uh, yeah. Uh, so we are in a mode now where, like, going into 2022 and beyond that, we are really going to be able to build on top of the foundations that we've made with Ivy. Um, so, you know, in Angular version 13, we made it so that like Ivy is now like the only thing, right? There's no Ivy anymore. It's just, this is just Angular now. Right. And with that done, uh, we are um, looking at doing, you know, more features and more evolutions on top of that. Um, now that we have this like really good foundation to build more stuff with. Yeah, and that is the number one reason why I'm so excited because I just wish that there was a way for you folks to get a really deep understanding of how many doors this opens up for us. And it's just such a great opportunity for the future. And I just can't wait to see all the great things that you folks have been so patient about coming to fruition. Um, and this game is really cool. I love when you enter these like 2d shapes there seems to be like a little splash animation on the face that you enter on yeah like, like a little burst of ink yeah right it's just such a nice little detail i just missed it oh that's brutal because i thought you were on it any plans to have an angular library for making games like ng phaser or something <laughs> uh not first party uh that would be way outside of our expertise area. So we would just be uh, making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no one piece of support from us, uh, first party support from us. But if somebody's out there, you know, wanted to figure out how to get change detection to work with the game loop and all that kind of stuff, go for it. I mean, people have done it. It's, it's not impossible, but that's just not, not, not our bag. Okay, let's see. Can we say this? Who will be the new components lead? Um, Andrew Seguin. Yeah, Andrew um, Seguin, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who you may have seen on GitHub here and there. Um, so yeah, the Components team, we've had like a very solid core for the last... Four, the last five, six years. Um, 
that's been like myself and Andrew Seguin and Miles Malerba. Um, we're not all the most active on social media, but um, <laughs> very like consistent team. Well, if you people want to see Jeremy tweet more, you got to follow him and you got to say, hey, Jeremy, tweet more, and then he'll do it. Yeah. I don't know what people want me to tweet about. All the I time, I'm like, I'll start to write a tweet too, and then I'll be like, I don't need to do this, and then delete it. <laughs> go on with my life. I don't need to do this. I love that answer. Um, that's probably more true for more things in my life than I acknowledge. I tweet a lot about like being a parent, which is really. Uh, a big thing in trying to get my life together, just considering all the different challenges we have. Like last night, I was supposed to, I told my wife was like, hey, um, what are you going to do right now? It's your turn to do bedtime. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go put his new bed together real quick. It'll take me like an hour max and then we'll be done. And it took me two and a half hours to get through it. And I'm just like, see, this is like the attitude where I should have known that there was no way I could have gotten done in 45 minutes because it takes you 45 minutes to unpack everything. But, you know, estimations are hard. Um, can we help with this question? I don't know if we can. Jason Lee asks, uh, when I upgrade to Tailwind V3 when it, with its JIT, just in time, I guess, compiler, it doesn't seem to generate the Tailwind classes. I'm guessing that this has to be configured in Angular.json. Is there any help we can give on this? Uh, that is probably a little bit too much on the debugging side to be able to to help with on a stream. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> if we knew our fan, we definitely help you. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. This is some good feedback. Uh, Leo says we need to to we need to do a better job teaching server side rendering. I have a video out about that. Leo, did you see the video about server side rendering with Angular Universal? And if you did see that and you still think we could do better, can you let me know how? Oh, okay. So uh, Dimitri says, are there any plans to, re to reuse pre-rendered data in SSR for hydration? You said that. That was part of the plan we're trying to explore. Yeah. So in, for data in particular, uh, that is also something we're thinking about of how to... Um, be able to like embed data in your initial server rendered page and then use that data on the client um, in a really user-friendly way. Um, again, like this is the, not a, a promise that this is something we're definitely going to deliver, uh, but it's something that we are very actively thinking about for the next year. Oh, look, I only got four out of five of those spinny things. I'm going to go back and try to find the one I missed. Yeah, do it. Do it. Okay, let's see. I, I have a question for the ask. audience is like, what does this game look like for like when you're not playing it? Does it just like, can you follow at all what's happening? No. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, friends at home. What does this game look like? It looks like some like cell stuff, like you're a blood cell or something, or some type of like bacteria, maybe. But not like a tardigrade. So, like, if there's an octopus version of a tardigrade, that's what it looks like. Yeah, it's like you're this little, just like microcellular organism that is like moving between these cells. I already got that one. You didn't get that one, damn. <laughs> oh snap! I forgot to make a make a checkpoint. So, how long can you live outside of a cell? Um, I mean, you just, there's gravity, and so you would just fall. Got if, it. Uh, if you're out there. Ooh, you just stay still. Oh, right. Mike Brokey says, Mike B says, Scully does this. So, all right. Scully has some uh, help with uh, reusing pre-rendered data. I want, you know, uh, Mike B in the chat, uh, where did the name Scully come from? Because when I think Scully, I think a hat. See, I think oh, of what is a pilot. <laughs> oh, Scully. Yeah, see? Oh, I think of Uncharted. That's another place I think of it. Scully. Or is it Sully? OK, 
Okay, let's go. Oh, okay. Here's a here's a good question for us. Not sure if this has been asked here yet, but are there any good ways of typing template outlet context? Typing template outlet context. Um, I think we do that for the CDK table. Um, it's never. I don't think there's ever going to be a situation in which the framework or anything can infer the type of the context object. I think it's always going to be something that you have to put manually, but you should be able to, if you know the type of the context that the template is going to be rendered with, you can make up a type and give it to the, to the template ref. Let's hmm, everything down here. Ooh, ah, this cool. is a this is a real thing. Here. <laughs> Let's go. So Scully from the X Files because she's a female hero and we are hero devs. Got it. All right. All right. Very cool. Man, Hans came through with the questions. I love this energy. So friends, for the next uh, Q and A gaming stream, be like Hans. Bring your questions ready so we can answer as many as we can. Uh, when styling angular material components, sometimes I need ng deep, and for some other parts, I don't. So I can style material host components directly, but nothing deeper inside these. So, like, what are the limitations here? So, yeah, this is a really good question. And I actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, I sat down with Emma, who is another yep. angular DevRel, and we started a draft to give people uh, better guidance on this topic exactly. Um, and the key takeaway is that the way you need to think about the internals of a component, in particular its DOM structure and the classes and styles applied inside, is that those are the private implementation details of that component. In the same way that if you are consuming a TypeScript class, uh, trying to override those styles is like trying to set the private members of a TypeScript class, where you know ultimately you can do it um, but you are using something that is not a supported API of that component. And so the alternatives to doing that really all fall on the component author, right? The component author needs to provide some sort of API that facilitates customization. And the way that we recommend people create an API like that today is with CSS variables or CSS custom properties as they're technically called. And I realize Angular Material does not do this, and that's because Angular Material was developed in a in a time when we could not use CSS variables yet. And so uh, that is actually another thing we are looking at doing for 2022 of shifting Angular Material's theming system to be based on CSS variables, in particular um, on a system that is coming out of the material design group at Google called Design Tokens that should make it easier to customize more aspects of Angular Material components. Um, I don't have a very detailed uh, explanation of what that's going to look like yet, but it is something that is going to, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, reason, pretty confident saying that that's going to be in our goals for 2022. Um, other ways other than using CSS variables would be to define SAS mixins for a component um, or uh, you could also do things with like CSS parts if you're using Shadow DOM, uh, but that is a little bit like harder um, because one, CSS parts I think aren't supported in Safari yet, or maybe they are. Um, but either way, right, you're still giving people a blank check on which CSS properties they can overwrite. And sometimes you don't want that even if you are exposing a particular element inside of your Shadow DOM that you want to let people customize. Wow, Jeremy had time today for that one. <laughs> yes, this is a topic I can talk about for a long time because it's a it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the years and also something a lot of people have asked me about over the years. Sure, sure. Into the abyss? Oh, see? Speed running. <laughs> Just kind of yeet yourself forward and maybe you'll land in something. I'll make myself a little checkpoint. 
Oh, you were partially in two little things right there at the same time. I have a feeling the little collectible that I missed is somewhere in this area. <laughs> like, what's up here? Oh, interesting. Orange to orange. Okay, might be coming through with another question. Anglo material theming is the subject uh, or the theme. Blah blah. Uh, there's good documentation for theming, but not for creating your own palette. What's a good resource for defining your own custom palette? Well, Mike, have you checked out the Angular Material theming documentation since I think version 12? Um, we actually have a new uh, rewritten guide for um, our theming system that goes into the specifics of palettes and creating your own custom palettes, uh, which really Let's boils go. down to... Um, defining a SAS map that has the same structure that ours consumes. Ooh, I found it. I found it, Mark. Yay, let's go! Alright. I have no sense of space in this game, though. Like, I can't tell how far anything is apart because I'm not really playing. Yeah, it's easier when you're playing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like... Was that close or far away? How far are you from the beginning? I can't tell. Uh, but yeah, this game is really awesome. I'm surprised, right? I, I didn't have super high expectations, um, but maybe I should have. Wait, speaking of games, Jeremy, did you see the uh, announcement out coming out of the Game Awards last night? Which one? The one about the Telltale Games and the Expanse oh. collab. I did see that. I'm intrigued. I do love The Expanse. I know. Oh, I know. I have to still finish season one, but um, it was pretty good. You know what was messing me up? It's just that there's so many groups. And, you know, it's one of those shows like Game of Thrones where you watch it and then you don't really understand all the relationships until like season three. You're like, oh, now all that drama in season one makes so much sense. And I feel like that's where I am with The Expanse. But it's still really intriguing. Oh, I'm scrambling. <laughs> hey, it's our first musician in the building. Let's go. Welcome back to the stream. Starving Musician came with us. I think our first stream that we did, Jeremy. So it's good to see you again, Starving Musician. Welcome back. Um, is there any plans to release a tool to convert Angular JS around, uh, I guess, greater than 1.4 to Angular 13? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I mean, you can go through the ng upgrade yeah. path and see how far that gets you, but we're not going to have like a dedicated tool, I don't think. Yeah. Um, at this point, the the tooling for upgrading from uh, Angular JS to Angular, like. It is basically in its final state, um, maybe barring some small bug fixes that might happen. But uh, the idea would be if you if you really wanted to, like you could update from Angular JS to um, well, I just, like I'm trying to think about this now because I haven't thought about it in a while. Like what I was probably going to say was going like using ng upgrade to, I guess you would just start writing stuff with the most recent version of Angular and using ng-upgrade to like, to mix the two because that should still work today even with like Angular version 13. Yeah, another thing to consider, uh, I was gonna call this out. Thanks Mike B, I didn't forget about you. I was waiting until Jeremy finished. Uh, we actually wrote a blog post about just like the end of life at uh, for Angular JS. Like this is the end of it actually in this month, 2021. I wrote a blog post about that, and I wrote another one about how there are some consulting teams that are really great at this uh, task, Jeremy, who could probably help walk you through it. Um, so I would say look at like teams like Hero Devs, for example. They specialize in stuff like that, and they could probably help you figure out a way for you and your organization to get forward, to move forward, because they, they love AngularJS and they do some great work there. 
<laughs> um, Paul says, do I reckon there ever be official support for writing Angular Apps and Dart? So there is Angular Dart out there, but it's a different project, friends. That's another thing you got to remember. It's a different project. Yeah, so a little bit of history there is that when Angular version 2 was first being developed, the code was being authored in TypeScript, and there was a tool called ts to dart that transformed the TypeScript version of the framework into a Dart version of the framework. And around the time that Angular 2 went to stable, um, we all like came to the conclusion that the best thing at that point moving forward was for the Dart team to take ownership of the Dart version of the framework and the Angular team keep working on the TypeScript version. And the the Dart team did, you know, continue to work on and maintain Angular Dart over the years um, as an open source project. Um, but eventually, I think it was at sometime in the last year or the last two years, um, they found that the adoption was uh, not quite enough for them to be able to keep investing in the Dart version of Angular. And uh, like, you know, Flutter is really the like the big uh, thing that the dark you know the dark group is really focused on these days um and so angular the dart version of angular is still out there and you can still go use it but it's not really updated anymore yep. correct correct okay starving musician came back for, for the stream but he came back bringing or they came back bringing a hard question all right a hard question so how can i control the browser's back button event with candy activate guard more naturally uh without confirming you know what i mean if you know what i mean um do you know about this jeremy i don't uh uh yeah i don't really know the details here i think this is maybe a little bit more complicated than we'd be able to figure out uh on the fly it needs a little more context yeah, see if you can give us a little bit more context. Uh, maybe we can help here. If not, uh, find us on Twitter. Because we'll, I know we will announce some office hours that you can come and get help as well, too, at some point. So keep an eye out for that, uh, for these types of really hard questions. Um, it's a good question, though. I wish we had the answer. Yeah, OK. Uh, Jeremy from the chat. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, right now the way is that is to go through version by version if you can do it manually. But like I said, check out some of the resources from consultants who do this type of stuff. Uh, I know also I know Sam Julian, uh, Sam Julian, Julian, right? Um, has a bunch of content on working through this type of stuff. So hopefully it works out. Oh, here's a question. I like this question. Uh, what games make us feel the most nostalgic? Coming from Alex. A link to the past. Uh, oh, yeah? Like, undoubtedly, right? That that game transports me right back to fifth grade. <laughs> Ugh. It's, it's, uh, for me, I so I have a Nintendo Switch, and I have the, the Super Nintendo and SNES-like expansion or whatever. So my four-year-old is going through all these like brutal games that are too hard because they are from a different generation of games. And I was playing uh, Star Fox with him. And I just couldn't believe that like in 1991, right? Like I was like 10. I was only six years older than he is now when I first played that game. And it was just so weirdly nostalgic to like play it again thinking that i probably never play it again because of the fact that it was on a cartridge that I no longer owned. Yeah, great question. Uh, are you guys working remote or from the office? Um, can we answer that? I don't know. Maybe yes. Yeah. Maybe um, we can talk about what we're doing. We don't. Okay. We don't speak for Google. <laughs> That's right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's right. Uh, so, what are you doing, Jeremy? Um, so, I've been working from home. Um, I recently moved to Seattle. Uh, so, um, 
I'm hoping to get back into the office in the not too distant future. Um, but for for the time being, I'm at home, um, which you can see my my nice, lovely background behind me. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I work from home. I do hybrid now, where I go to the office uh, a couple times a week. I really like it. It's a uh, it's a nice way to get out of the house, and it's just like get some fresh air and the google offices are really cool so i really like that but it's not like like the movie the intern don't don't think that's what we do all day like nap pods and like whatever else vince vaughn was doing in that movie that's not accurate we do work <laughs> and it is very comfortable though it's a very comfortable space what kind of content jeremy uh sistrunk are you talking about because is there something you're missing, or are you just saying that you want to be a part of the party? Because if you do want to be a part of the party, you should apply for jobs here if you feel like you want to be uh, involved. I love Angular and took the seventh version today. I finally upgraded that one to the eighth version. That was a great experience. The plan of update with 18, the 13 step by step. Good luck with that, and uh, reach out. You know, uh, to like the online spaces because there are lots of people who talk about these types of upgrades to get up to 13, to take advantage of IP, etc. Tech Stack Overflow and other places to make sure that you're getting uh, support. Oh, here's a great question. Since the pandemic, have we been holding Angular meetups? Uh, we haven't been hosting any directly, but there are tons that are still going on virtually. Okay, let's see. Can you please consider relative path to lazy loaded module? Sure, you have to tell me we can consider it. I don't know. <laughs> Jeremy, can we consider this? Uh, I don't have an answer for that because I don't know enough about why it doesn't, uh, why that wouldn't work already. Like, uh, right. I, I think someone else on the team would have to uh, provide a little bit more context there. All right, you wish. Okay, listen, Jeremy, reach out to me on Twitter. We could talk about this. I'm at Mark Texan. Uh, the interviews are hard, but if you have the right preparation, you might have better success. Uh, I think a lot of the interview process is about preparation and just making sure you're like ready. And I know that sounds really generic, but I think for me, that was a big part of it, just being ready. Yeah, same. Like I, I've been at Google for um, a little under ten years. It'll be ten years in May, and like, so I don't know how relevant my like interview experience is anymore. But um, it was also very much about preparation. Um, like I spent uh, a few weeks studying for an interview. And really, like, the way I think about the interview, like, just my own personal take, is it's less about trying to figure out what you know, um, right? Like, we, you, if you are you know, an abstract company hiring, just knowing that someone has memorized how hash maps work, it's like, it's not bad, but it's not really what you want. Um, what you want instead is someone who is able to learn um, and someone who is good at solving problems. And even if you are going into an interview like Google's is like notoriously about data structures and algorithms, even if that's not something you're using in day-to-day -day life, the fact that you can go and learn that stuff um, leading up to the interview demonstrates that capability to learn. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, Jeremy spent the month. I spent three months studying every night for two hours a night just to be ready. So I uh, I get it. Like I, like I get it. Like for some people, that's that's not appetizing. You know what I mean? To think about putting that much work in and then the outcome may not be favorable for what you want. Uh, for me, it was. Um, yeah, I think for me coming to Google because I had worked at other big companies, this was. You know, it was a it was a swing for the for the fences for me. Like I was like, all right, I'm gonna go for it, and 
I had actually turned down Google interviews for years for that same reason. So Jeremy, you're you're totally like spot on. Like I was like, yeah, they would call. I'm like, nope, nope. I already have a job, and I like not studying right now. <laughs> And then one day I just said, okay, you know what? Let me try it. Let me just give my best shot. And it worked out for me. So, um, yeah. And I was fortunate that I got in on my first try, right? Like, but I was totally prepared to get told that I wasn't ready yet in my first round. And mentally, I was prepared to like only make it to like, let's say, maybe not make it past the phone screen. And then you know, for next year or six months, what I needed to do, and then kind of repeat that process until I got in. That's what, that's what I was prepared to do. You know, and, uh, but it's like I said, for me, it just worked out that I had the right amount. I actually wrote about my study plan. Um, exactly how I studied and even how I took notes, what type of like music I listened to. I wrote about all of that. So that's why I said, uh, Jeremy, reach out to me on Twitter. I'd love to share that with you. I share it with anybody who wants to see it, right? Like I'll, I'll post it uh, on Twitter if anybody's ever interested. But I could tell you exactly how I studied, like what my actual time looked like, resources, everything. I don't know if that's helpful, but could be. Uh, here's a good question. What should I do to become an Angular GDE? Paul, here's a great, great way to become an Angular GDE. Get with an existing Angular G GDE, learn about the process, and then get them to refer you what you have like the qualifications for it. <laughs> oh, well, that was lucky. Yeah, and I'm on Twitter. I am Mark Texan. Jeremy, can I give out your Twitter as well? Yeah, it is Joe Born. Yep, Joe Born. There you go. Yeah, put your Twitter out there as well. I don't know why it's not showing our, our like name tags here while we're in in Zoom, but I mean not Zoom, but in the uh, in the stream, but. It's not showing. I don't know. All right, friends. I think we got time for a few more questions, and then we'll call it a day. It's been great. Um, oh, here's a good question. What are the more suitable topics to create angles about Angular? I'm doing Russian mostly, so trying something that what will be useful for people. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think people are really interested in in Angular Plus uh, technology. So think about like doing some videos about Angular Plus GraphQL or doing video Angular Plus Firebase or something like that. That people really like that. And I think if you have some advanced topics that you can talk about, I think people would love to see that as well. Yeah, Paul, do that. Hit us up. 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 Uh, is there a way to get bug bounties with Angular packages? Is that like where, where we pay people to like fix bugs? Um, yeah, mostly it's for like security issues are the thing that like people will tend generally have bug bounty programs for. Um, I don't actually know if Angular is included in Google's general bug bounty program. Um, right. Mark, maybe that's something we need to like check in on and follow up with. <laughs> yeah, I just wrote that down like a oh, bug bounty program. Yeah. Jeremy S in the in the chat coming up with some follow up points for us to do. I love it. Yeah, I'm gonna follow up on this stuff. That sounds great. All right, fr all right, friends. Listen, uh, we got got time for one. One or two more questions, and then we're gonna end the stream for today. Uh, Jeremy, what's the name of this game? So I can type it in chat in case we want to play. It is. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, Yinglet, which I will spell it out for you. Um, it is Y N G L E T. I wonder if this is on Switch. You know what? It wouldn't have to be on Switch if Valve had to release the Steam Deck this month like they promised. I will be playing it right now. 
Yeah, me too. Me too. I can't wait to get uh, my Steam Deck. Like, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about, like, hardware for the new 2022. I want to see about the Steam Deck, because even if it's 75% as good as, as people are hoping, I think that'll be a major win. And it'll just let me get through my Steam catalog as I'm on the train to go to the office, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it because I... Um... Just be nice to just sit on the couch and play Slay the Spire without having to throw it up on the TV. Yeah, and I have to share my TV with with uh, two other people, and they play Luigi's Haunted Mansion all day, every day. My <laughs> wife and my kid, that's all they play together. And then she plays, uh, she plays Animal Crossing a ton. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I say I have a Nintendo Switch, you should really. Phrase it as I had a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> I had one, and now they have it. So uh, my Steam Deck will be my personal computing, you know, paradise. Mm, you you say that now, <laughs> All right? Until they see it. What games are they going <laughs> to discover on the Steam Deck that they want to play? Uh, I can only imagine. My my kid is a uh, he's 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 a gamer. He loves games at four, and you know, I didn't know if he was going to take into the lifestyle, but he has. Oh wait, there's one more thing. Let's see. Is there any documentation on integrating Tailwind CSS3 with persistent cache and enabled in Angular 13? Uh, nothing that we wrote. Yeah, I know we support uh, Tailwind CSS as part of Angular CLI. Uh, I don't really know anything beyond that about any interaction it might have with the persistent cache. Okay, I'm gonna go back to something. Um, Rustam, remember you asked me what are some things to make videos about? Tailwind plus <laughs> Angular, because we have a lot of Tailwind plus Angular uh, comments. So here's your opportunity. The streets want to know how Tailwind and Angular work together. <laughs> Wait, this is a good question. See, uh, let's see. Angular MMO, when? We're working on it right now. Coming out to uh, when, Jeremy? Q12 of uh, 2064. Uh, didn't Google I.O. last year have kind of an MMO-like experience where you could get yes. it in the field? Yeah. See? I, feel like, I feel like we can call that close enough. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, last thing. Do we have to add the component to module 1.4? Do you have to add the components to NG module in version 1.4 of AngularJS? Oh, I don't, I don't remember this one. Oh, I don't know that anybody on the team remembers that much about AngularJS anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm freaking out right now because this looks like a green screen behind me now, but it's not. This is real. But like when I'm standing in front of it, I feel like it looks like a bad green screen, like it's like I'm chroma keyed or something. This is a real background. All right, enough. Enough. Google called you for an interview. Mark, stop flexing. Google called me for an interview. They did, but they didn't know that I wasn't good. You know, so that's why I have to study for three months. <laughs> uh, let's see. Last question is, you know, I'll get the stop. Okay, I get it. Uh, okay, last question, and then we're going to uh, call this uh, the end of the day. Are you guys doing this kind of videos often? We're doing these once a month, and... And we're going to have, uh, so Jeremy is going to be playing games for most of these. I am the co-host, but we have some guest co-hosts coming to the stream. So you get to meet more Angular leads and more Angular people. It's going to be great. We have other co-hosts there. So if you want to see somebody besides me, your wish is coming true. I mean, you should get to play games too, Mark. We're going to, we're going to make you play games. I am going to play. We played, what game did we play when Emma and I uh, did the stream that one month in October? We play trying four. That was fun, but it is really hard to answer questions while you're playing video games. Yes. I yeah. think you notice there, there's a couple of times when someone would ask me a, an in-depth question. I just kind of stopped and talked. About All right. It. You kind of have to, you kind of have to. And uh, yeah, uh, trying is a very fun game to play co-op. So we'll get some, maybe we'll do some co-op games in 2022. Like you and I did some co-op. And we can get a third person to like moderate the questions and be the host so we can like play and focus. So, all right, friends. Well, listen, this has been a blast to hang out with you. Thank you for coming to chill with us and get your questions answered. Jeremy, it's always good to hang out with you as well. 
All right. So, and thank you. I got to beat half of that game at work. <laughs> let's go. That is the best way to live your life. You get to have fun and play games at work. So, all right, friends, we'll see you the next time. Until then, go build great apps.